morning. I uh, would like to just. Uh, do you mind if you turn the light on until we? Thank you. Um, remember the little talk before the talk. Do you mind if we just have a few minutes? Um, and then we'll dive into the uh, the last uh, discussion. So, and I said this to, uh, I shared this with some of you, so forgive me if it's redundant to you. Um, I would like to share with you a new way that we understand mathematics. Okay, so those of you who heard this, forgive me. A new math, a new type of math, where you add by subtracting and multiply by dividing. It's a very different kind of math and arithmetic than what you've learned in school. For example, if I were to share with Mina um, $10, I have $20, and I have, I shared with, or I gave Mina $10, $10 of my $20, I will end up having less money, right? So materialistic possessions, when shared, they decrease in value. Spiritual possessions, when shared, they increase in value. If I were to have, if, if I have love, and if I share my love with Mina, I will end up having more love. If I have peace, and I share my peace with Mina, I will end up having more peace. If I have joy, I share this joy with Mina, I will end up having more joy. That's the math that we ought to operate according to. Okay? Materialistic possessions decrease when shared. Spiritual possessions increase when shared. Let us have that increase. Okay. So let's have a recap and then dive in. Remember we shared, or I shared with you three terms I think it would be useful for you to uh, further investigate and research the word news, the word news, which means mind. mind, the seat of the intellect, understanding, transcendentals, anyone remembers what they are? What are the transcendentals? Yes. Yes, truth, goodness, and joy. Eudaimonia. Anyone remembers eudaimonia? I mentioned it briefly last or yesterday. Euphoria forever or something like that? Not euphoria. Forever. Euphoria, okay, feeling good forever. Feeling good, uh, um, feeling good spiritually, feeling good forever. You means good. Daimon, spirit. Eia denotes permanence. Being good in your spirit forever, it's equivalent to the word in Coptic, Makarios. Okay, so look up Makarios, look up Eudaimonia, look up Transcendentals and Nous, and um, understand what they mean. So let's begin with some questions to recap and dive in. What are the questions? What are the three faculties of the soul? We talk, we, our feeling body, we know what the body looks like and what it is. We know what the spirit is, it's what the God-given breath that we have. What is the? What are the three faculties of the soul? The intellect, the mind, the will and the heart, exactly. The mind, the will, the volition, and the heart, the seat of our emotions. Tayyip, what is our purpose in life? To know God and to make Him known and to share God. What should I feed my mind? The truth. What is truth? The Lord Jesus Christ. So the question is not what is truth. Who is truth? Who said that? What is truth? Pilate. No, Pilate. Pilate said to the Lord Jesus, Pilate standing in front of truth incarnate asked him this question. You can read that in John 18, 38. He said, what is truth? What was the response? No. The response was that he left before wanting to hear the response from the Lord. What shall I do in order to renew my mind? I shall be filled with the Spirit. How do I know I'm filled with the Spirit? 
when I'm overflowing unto others, people that are around me. What does tribulation mean? To squeeze. Tribulation means to squeeze. And what is squeezed in you will come out of you. Okay? Lastly, how do I perfectly and practically demonstrate my love to God? By loving one another. That's kind of quick, that's a quick recap. Now let's go to some practical tips for our spiritual, mental, physical wholesomeness. They were ten. I reduced them to five for the sake of time so that we can yeah, yeah, finish on time because I have a flight to catch. All right. Number one, these are some practical tips that are aimed to help us take inventory of our thoughts, examine ourselves, take inventory of our emotions and feelings, and also learn the, um, the skills or have the, cap the ability to say no to toxic thoughts and the ability to say yes to edifying and constructive thoughts in our mind. <laughs> Number one, live in the present. They're very simple, and I'm going to take a few minutes on each one of them. Living in the present. We can't change the past. You can't change the past. But you can ruin a perfectly good present by worrying about the future. I'll just take another one. That one's bad. Okay. You can't change the past. Is this better? Is this okay? You can't change the past, but you can ruin a perfectly good present by worrying about the future. Most often, we allow past problems and future concerns to ruin our present moment. And here's how we oftentimes live. We usually live in two unreal times. We live between the past and the future. If you were to pause and ask yourselves or think within yourselves the last few seconds, were you really in the present? Or was your mind thinking of some event that took place in the past that you are preoccupied with? Or you're concerned with what you will be doing tomorrow morning? And you're not really here, you're thinking there. I guarantee you, half of you, if not all of you, would say, yes, I was actually, for a moment, I was drifting into the past, and I'm drifted, or I'm, I'm drifting, rather, into the future, but I'm not really in the present. But for you to be able to examine yourself and take inventory of your thoughts, you have to be living in the present moment. Because the past is dead. And the future is not yet born. So why ruin the present by not being in the present? What do we all have? The present, that's all we have. The past is dead, the future is not yet born. And that present is ever flowing, marching towards the future. If you miss out on this present, you're missing out on your life and the experiences in life. Here's one Antiochian Orthodox priest, and this is what he said. We must live in the present because oh, that is all there is. There is only now. If we stop and examine what is going on in our heads most of the time, we will find that our minds are busy weaving stories about what happened to us in the past and what may happen in the future, moving often between regret and anxiety. The mind is good at this. Unless we actually direct the mind to be present, it rarely is. But we must learn to live in this present. Do you all remember this expression, the good old days? Remember the good old days when the TV monitor, or whatever, TV screens were like this, or computer monitors were like that, or remember the remember Pac-Man, Miss Pac, all of these, the good old days, you know, whatever, um, good old friends, passion, all of these things? Well, guess what? Today, this week, this month, this year, will be the good old days of years to come. Five years from now, this will be the good old days. So why don't we make these good old days count so that we remember good memories with them? 
Here is, an, this is anonymous, I don't know who the, actually the author is, but I thought it was very um, um, relevant. First, I was dying to finish my high school and start college. And then I was dying to finish college and start working. Then I was dying to get married and have children. And then I was dying for my children to grow old enough so that I could go back to work. But then I was dying to retire. And now I'm dying. And suddenly I realized I forgot to live. I think it's very relevant where we almost think, I'll be happy when I get married. I'll be happy when I have children. I'll be happy when I get this job. I'll be happy when I retire. I'll be happy when my children go out to college and finally I can have some peace and quiet. I'll be happy. And then you'll realize that life is experienced. It's actually not so much the destination, it's the journey that we often experience as well. What does the scripture say? Every one of these five, I'll have some relevant verses from the scriptures. Our Lord comes to us and meets us in the present moment. We only have that present and we must live in this present if we were to meet the Lord. In 2 Corinthians, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heads, hearts. And in Hebrews 3, Exhort one another daily while it is called today. Live in today. Do not live with the regret of the past and the anxiety of the future. So number one, learn to live in this pre in the present moment and only live in the only when you live in the present will you be able to take inventory of your thoughts, examine yourselves and know exactly what you're taking in and what you are producing as far as thoughts. Number two, let others shine. Let others shine. What do I mean by that? We live in an age of I'll call it a narcissistic age where it's all about me. Look at me, look at my accomplishments, look at my achievements, look at the way I look, the way I dress, the way I drive, the way I eat, the way I... It's all about me. It's the me generation. Let me tell you... Uh, um, or let me ask you, the next time someone tells you a story about themselves or shares an accomplishment with you, Notice your tendency to say something about yourself in return. I'll give you some examples. Like, for example, you're on vacation for a week, you go back to work, and you tell your colleagues, I was on vacation for a week. Guess what? I came back on Monday, I had 120 emails to respond to. Immediately, I get the reply. When I was on vacation for 10 days, I had 250 emails I had to respond to. Does that sound familiar to y'all? Always come back, but it's, I call it the one-up game. Hey, you're going to tell me an accomplishment? My accomplishments are more meaningful than yours, or more significant, more important. My life is more interesting than yours. Listen to me. That's what we're basically saying subtly. Um, this happens a lot with mothers bragging about their kids. My son did this and this and this and that. Well, my daughter did this and this and that. I went out to lunch one day with work, with my colleagues, celebrating a colleague's birthday. And we're sitting down, with half a dozen of us, and we're talking. And I'm, I can't help but analyze people. And, and I'm listening, and I saw so many people talking. No one was listening. Everyone is just saying what they've done, their accomplishments. But is that really effective method of communication? Absolutely not. I think the biggest communication problem is that we don't listen to understand, we listen to reply. But we don't really hear or listen or be attentive to people. So notice your tendency when someone, and I said to you I have 120 emails, can I get some sympathy? Can I get, oh wow, can I get really, can I get something, validation? You know what I mean? No validation whatsoever. I have a better or more significant accomplishment that I want to share with you. So, to maintain psychological wellness, wholesomeness, mental, spiritual, physical, let others give them their moment of glory. What will happen to you 
the attention you need from others will be replaced when you give them that attention with what? The quiet sense of inner confidence that is derived from letting others have that attention. I don't need to always be one up. Let others shine. What does the scripture say? We complete, I'm saying this, the, the scriptures will say what's coming next. We complete one another. We don't compete with one another. It's one letter that makes a big difference. We complete, not compete with one another. Romans 12, 5. We being many are one body in Christ and individually members with one another. Your glory is my glory because we complete one another. And we're not competing with one another. In 1 Thessalonians 5.11, comfort each other and edify one another. Don't look at just me and me and my accomplishments, my stories, my achievements. Give others the glory. 1 Corinthians 10, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. So number one, live in, learn to live in the present moment. Or the present Number two, let others shine. Number three, mind your own business. <laughs> Do you all know that this is a verse in the scriptures? It is. Read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. This is what St. Paul said. That you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands as we commanded you. That's a verse in the scriptures. I'm sure many of you will take a picture of this, and you have a lot of people in mind <laughs> that you want to text it to. But I'm talking to you, not to them. I'm just, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't mean to say that. I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to myself. This is a lesson for me, not for you. You guys are not doing anything. Um, don't worry about what I'm doing. Worry about why you're worried about what I'm doing. Basically, we need to mind our own business simply because our business will not mind its own. We need to mind our own business. But minding our own business, not but, and minding our own business also means that we ought not to compare ourselves to other. Comparing ourselves to other. We oftentimes compare ourselves to other and see if we match up. What do we compare? Our possessions. Well, he bought this house, or he got this car, he got this job, whatever. Our appearance. You look at a billboard and say, why can I not look like that? Or an image that comes to you on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, why can I, look, can I not look like that? Circumstances. Why am I almost the bridesmaid, not the bride? Why am I this? Why am I not that? What am I, you know? You, you always compare yourself with others. And then you live a life of what? I wish, I wish, I wish. And actually, sometimes you may not verbalize it, but you're thinking, I wish my wife was like his wife. I wish, I wish I had a husband like her husband. I wish I had a job like his job like his job. I wish I had hair like his hair or her hair. Whatever. You can the, the options are unlimited. Do you know what I'm saying? I wish, I wish. I, you compare yourselves to others. And you find yourself living a life of, I wish, I wish, I wish. Comparison leads to what? Resentment. Comparison leads to not fulfilling your unique purpose in life that God has given you and only you. If you were to mind your own business and if you were to not compare yourselves to other, but compare yourselves to Christ, then you will be fulfilling the purpose for which you are here in this world. So, what else? Help, uh, I just want to make sure I'm clear so no one will misunderstand me and say, okay, I don't have to, I don't want to deal with people, I don't want to talk to people, that's not what I'm saying. Help others, be there for others, love others, yet mind your own business when it's destructive to you and others. So this is the way you balance it. I mean, I'll be, don't, you know, don't have to say to yourself, I can't believe she did that, I can't believe he said these things. This is when you're not minding your own business. What does the scripture say? Mind your own business. First Peter 4.15 Let none of you suffer as a murderer, 
and be an evildoer or as a busybody in other people's matters. What's a busybody? Gossiping. Gossiping and getting into other people's matters. In other words, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Let each one, Galatians 6, let each one, bless you, examine his own work, his own business, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. How many times he says his own, his own himself? <coughs> Exodus 20, 17, one of the Ten Commandments. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife nor anything that is your neighbor's. Mind your own business and do not compare yourselves to others. You're missing out on a lot. When you say, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. Number four, set appropriate boundaries. Let's recap. Live in the present. Let others shine. Mind your own business. Set appropriate boundaries. Appropriate boundaries. A boundary is a marking where you end and the other begins, and where you begin and the other ends. That's what a boundary is. It's basically a line over which you will not allow anyone to cross. By the way, each of these five tips, practical tips, yeah, he deserves uh, a lecture of its own. That's, I'm trying to be as concise as possible so that we can yeah, finish online. Uh, emotional, physical boundaries. It's an emotional and physical space between you and the other person. What do boundaries do? Why are boundaries important? They do two things. Can someone help me? Now you raise your hand and tell me what do boundaries do and why are they important? Help me out. Yes, ma'am. Yes, protection. One more. More balanced life. Exactly. You know where you begin and he or she end, or begins or ends. Yeah. Like they keep the bad out and the good in. Exactly. So they protect you. They keep the bad out and the good in. Excellent. Yes. Yes. I gotta shake your hand. I'm looking for that. Thank you. I'm looking for this. Because boundaries, yeah, do protect you for sure, but they more than protect you, they define you. They define and protect you. What do I mean by define you? Look at this picture, you understand. There's a house. It has a boundary in the form of a fence. This fence defines the boundaries of the house. If I would like to know the square footage of this house, I will look at the fence provided that this fence is in the perimeter of the house, um, it, will, it will tell me where it begins and where it ends. The boundary defines that which is inside. You have a boundary around yourself that defines yourself and your soul. Not only does the fence define where it begins, where it ends, but it also protects from unwanted people or animals in this case to enter. And then what should we have on this house? We should have this sign. Private property, trespassers will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law and this is how we should set boundaries for ourselves. Boundaries are markings around ourselves. The property in this case is not a house, it's our soul. We also have boundaries for protection and for definition. So. There's a lot I want to say about each one of these. That's an amashik surah. I keep saying that. I'm going a little quickly for the sake of time. Number five, and my favorite one. Set aside quiet time every day. Because we live in a world of noise. And we live in a world that's um, depicted by this picture. I am busy always busy. Actually becomes a badge of almost yeah, the, uh, to brag by saying, oh, I'm so busy, I'm so busy. I do this at work all the time. I know this guy doesn't do much in his job and he's always saying, I'm busy, I'm busy. And I know that the more he says, I'm busy, the more 
tells me that he's not doing enough. Anyways, BizEasy awesome. has become, um, I hope this is not recorded or anything like that. <laughs> I don't want to lose my job. It is? <laughs> so, it will be posted later on to Excellent. Uh, as long as it stays within Canada, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm busy, busy, busy. What are you doing? I'm busy. I don't have time. I was talking to uh, one of you earlier today and I said, um, what is the most, I'll just shift gears and come back. What is the most ex uh, commonly used excuse for not praying? Busy. I don't have time. I don't have time to pray. But let me tell you, my friends, I think we have it backwards. You don't want to say, I don't have time to pray. You should say, I don't, I don't what? I don't have time to pray. No. I don't prioritize. I don't have time because I don't pray. That's how we should look at it. What do I mean by that? If you were to give God the little bit of time he asked for, give God your five loaves and two fish, hand it to him, he will return it back to you, multiply. Give God your five minutes every single morning. He will give you plenty of time to do more than what you've ever dreamed of doing, dreamt of doing, okay? A quiet time with God, I should have said, forgive me, I said it wrong. I said, I don't have time because I don't pray. Rather than I don't pray because I don't have time, I don't have time because I don't pray. That's what I meant to say. A quiet time with God is a time set aside in a place where a person can get away, be alone, and draw near to the Lord. I left the text so that we can remember it as well. A quiet time involves a period of focused, concentrated, un uninterrupted fellowship with God. So you basically are removing yourself from the busyness of the world, of your everyday activity, and have this quiet moment in your day. Extremely important. I, that's why it's my, my favorite, and I think without it, um, I think it's important, let's put it this way, I don't want to get too personal. Um, I think quiet time is like a timeout. Think of a game, a basketball game, where the team, your team, the Raptors, for example, are not doing very well. So the coach, well, they're great, they're awesome. Okay. But the coach um, has seen that there are some, um, you know, um, the scheme of the defense is not on point, and that the, uh, the other team is scoring, you know, ahead of like a 10 to 2 run or something like that. What does the coach do? Time out. And what happens during this time out? Let's regroup, we strategize, come up with a game plan, and go back on the court and defend the and uh, and um, win win the game. You see, that's exactly what you're doing in your timeout, in your quiet time. You take time out from the game of life. You sit with yourself. What am I doing wrong? What am I doing right? Let's re-strategize and go back to the game of life so that we can win the day for the Lord. Does that make sense? You see the analogy. Quiet time is a time out that you ought to have. I have another analogy for you. When can this person see his or her, her reflection um, on this body of water? Only when it is still and calm. You throw a rock, she will not be able to see her reflection. And this is how we see ourselves when we are still and calm, quiet. In our quiet time, we quiet our senses. Let's get practical. How can we practically have quiet time? I have a formula for you, but I would love to hear your advice and your comments. To set a consistent time and a consistent place and a consistent plan every day. What I stress the word every day because I don't think we should just have quiet time um, once a year on your birthday or uh, on December 31st, 12 o'clock, or whatever. You know, that, that, these are times when you sit with yourself, what have I done this year? What have I done when I, I'm one year older? Whatever, that's not what I mean. I need quiet time every single day in your life for you to be able to navigate the channels of your life. So a consistent time, 
I'm just throwing some numbers here. In the morning, recommended obviously, to have some time. You can begin with five minutes, 10 minutes, two minutes, but at least you have the moment where you're quieting your senses, your life, yourself, reflective on what have you done yesterday, what you will do today, and how you can take God along with you so that you can be most productive. And I have a little asterisk here that says the length of the quiet time does not matter, but it should be enough time to meditate on what you're reading the scriptures, journaling, writing, whatever, in your diary, whatever, whatever that you do in your quiet time, but you have to have a consistent time um, every day. At a consistent place. Some like to be in their closet, bedroom, their wherever, at a consistent place where there are no interruptions, no TVs, no phones, nothing like that. You have to have that consistent place that's your inner, um, where your inner self can be present. A consistent plan. What do I do in this quiet time? I read the scriptures. I read some kind of spiritual meditation, article, devotion, whatever you call it. Write down your thoughts. Evaluate. Assess. And resolve. What does the scripture say about quiet time? To be still and to know that I am God. Our dear Heavenly Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, had a quiet time. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, it says, In the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. He wanted to get away from everyone. And pray. I love, I mean, I, as much as I hate flying, because I fly almost every other weekend, and I, airplanes, is, you know, I spend most of my, 50% of my life on airplanes, but I try to look at the positive side of it. It's a um, mandatory quiet time for me, and I think it's very important to take uh, advantage of it. 1 Corinthians 11, 28, but let the man examine himself. How can you examine yourself if you don't have that? How can you examine yourself? How can you look inwardly when your senses, if your senses are not quieted and calm? Uh, what else? Lamentation, I love this verse. Let us search, search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. Search out and examine. Dig deep in yourself, within yourself. Um, so we, again, I have some practical questions that I want to ask you during your quiet time. If you want to do your quiet time, some practical questions, and we'll, we'll wrap up. And we'll open, open for, uh, for your questions and, and comments. Here are some practical questions. How is my life different from those who live in this world? Or am I just living reactively to the patterns of this world, or according to the pattern, pattern of this world? What do my choices reveal about me? Here's an interesting question. If I was denied access to my Bible for the rest of my life, do I have enough knowledge to still grow in my faith? Am I willing to suffer for my faith? My favorite one. Here it is. When people see me, do they see that I'm a Christian? Or do they see the Christ in me? Who is my God? What is my God? Who do I worship? Do you know that we have three gods in this world that are man-made gods with the lowercase g? What are the man-made three gods of this world? Not the one true God. Three gods, only three. Money. Money, of course. Two. Pleasure. Last one. Power. Pa Who's in power? Power. Yes. Power. Uh, uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Second is humanism. Second is materialism, money, my possessions, what I own, my God is my money. And then the third is pleasure, hedonism, so hedonism, excellence. 
I'll shake your hand tomorrow. I mean, not tomorrow. <laughs> after we finish, because we're meeting after we finish. Okay? So hedonism is pleasure or the pursuit of sensual pleasure. So it's either I am God, my money is God, or my body is God. Man made God. And those three gods, by the way, are the three gods of this world. Do we hear these three gods in the liturgy? Yes, we do. If you pay attention to the readings, every single Sunday, at the end of the reading of the Catholic epistle, the deacon says what? Do not love the world, nor the things that are in the world. What are the things in the world? Lust, okay. Lust of the flesh, what is that? Hedonism. Okay, sense. Pleasure. Lust of the eyes, what is that? Materialism. Possessions. I want to own this. I want to, you know, amass wealth. Pride of life. Humanism. Me. Myself. And you know what's interesting? That those three are, if you want to draw the, uh, the comparison between those three gods and the three temptations of Christ, you'll see how they are aligned. When Satan tempted Christ and said, I know you've been hungry for 40 days, turn this stone into bread so that you can eat and fulfill your hunger, that's hedonism. In this case, it's the lust of, or gluttony or, or eating, lust of the flesh. Uh, remember when he told him, you see all of this Jerusalem, I can give all this to you if you were to worship me. What is that? Materialism, possessions. Satan didn't know that he already owns everything. Um, thirdly, throw yourself, and then the, the angels will come and honor you and lift you up. And what is that? <coughs> Humanism, pride of life. And you also see that I was contemplating on those three gods, and I realized that those three gods come to us as temptations in different stages in our lives. So in our adolescent stage in our life, we're mostly tempted with what? Pride. Not just pride. <laughs> exactly, hedonism. Pleasure. All I'm thinking about is the pleasures of life. I think that's what I'm consumed with um, in that stage in life. Now you get a little older into your 40s and 50s, and you're mostly tempted with what? Did I buy the house I wanted to buy? We wouldn't call it in the States. We have, have I lived the American dream? Buy the house. Did I buy the car I wanted to buy? Do I have enough money to retire on? The, right? Did I get the status I wanted to get at work in your 40s and 50s? What is that? Materialism. And then you get into your 60s and your 70s. You're tempted with humanism, karamti, my honor, my experience. Why are not people listening to me? You see, I have my pride and so on and so forth. So it's interesting how those three touch three different stages in life. Anyways, who is my God is a question we ought to ask ourselves. Am I worshiping a man made God, a God that I constructed, fabricated for myself, or am I worshiping the one true God? Number seven, if you miraculously found out that today is your last day on earth, what would you change and how would you spend it? As these are just self-reflective, reflective or reflecting, anyways, these are questions that help you reflect upon yourself, okay? Um, in conclusion, live, let, mind, set, and set. And these five Practical tips will help you achieve psychological wholesomeness, mental wholesomeness, uh, physical wholesomeness and well-being, as well as, of course, spiritual wholesomeness. Glory and honor be to God forever and ever. Amen. Any comments, questions? Now is the time where I learn from you, and please share with us your Please get the questions again. I'll get the questions again. Absolutely. Um, Yes, Rosalie. Can you maybe like give some uh, tips on how to set your boundaries and like how to communicate if someone um, uh, like oversteps your boundaries? Yes. Um, if someone has control over your emotions because you have not set good boundaries, the problem is not them. The problem is because you did not communicate this boundary firmly, lovingly, and firmly with them. I'm just I want to start with that. I'm, saying, I'm not saying this is what you're asking. 
but it's important for us to understand where I begin, where, where I should say, where I end and where the other begins. I have to create this boundary myself, and I have to know who I allow into that space and who I don't. It's important for us because we, we sometimes have, may have no boundaries, and we let people, for example, Sonia Salva, I'll use you again, Malish. Sonia Salva has her purse next to her, and I'm just looking at her purse, and I'm looking inside her purse, and when I see what's inside, even yet, if I don't have to touch it, well, that's a boundary that has been crossed. If I am, you know, physical boundaries that I want to demonstrate, but you know what I'm trying to say, physical boundaries also needs to be set, emotional boundaries, um, boundaries with, with, with friends, with colleagues, even with family members. So we have to know where we end and where the other begins for us to be wholesome. I guess my question is also like, how would Tan Sawa then like very lovingly and not not rudely say like, don't look at my purse. Like you know what I mean? Like how do you how do you communicate that like you you're said it. Here within my boundaries? You know the, the verse that says speak the truth and love. Well, she should, she should be very firm. Don't look at my purse. But you can say that in a nice way. But if I still continue to look at her purse, then the way changes a little bit. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. But sometimes we compromise our values and principles and or ah, I don't want to hurt his feelings. I'm mean, just giving you an example. I don't want to hurt uh, no, don't worry, hurt his feelings. <laughs> question and I do <laughs> yeah yeah I'm a victim of that as well at work. I work on a project, write a great project and I deliver on time, under budget and all of that and make the presentation to the executives and then everybody else gets the credit. No, that's not gonna happen. So let others shine, let others shine with wisdom. Um, in the workplace if you have um, worked on some kind of project, I'm just using this as an example and um, um, you, you wouldn't go and say, hey, and, uh, I didn't do anything, it was my colleague that did this work. I don't think that that's what, what I, what's intended by letting others shine. Um, yeah, take credit when credit is due. In the workplace, actually, you ought to shine for you to, um, um, to excel and be promoted and so on and so forth. <laughs> but there is something that you can do with tact, um, and you can do it knowing that your shining is actually, um, um, yeah, yeah. contributed not so much to your own um, doing, that can actually make, make you fall into uh, self-righteousness and self-pride. You can attribute that to God with, between you and yourself, but with others, if you have done something, you're due credit for it. And I don't see anything wrong with that in the workplace. But I'm talking um, in, in a in a communal <coughs> setting within your friends or your church or your Yani, use wisdom on when to let others shine when it's going to make you feel better and it's not going to yani, affect your promotion or your salary. But on the other side, on the other side, at the, at the workplace, take credit what credit is due in a loving way. Yes, sir. What's the difference between looking up to someone and comparing yourself yes. to that person? Yes. I'll have to tell you this, you know the difference. You will know the difference if you're comparing yourselves to them in an envious way, if you're, or if you're looking up to them so that you can learn something from them. Only you will know the difference. And I guarantee you, all of you will know the difference. Deep down, you'll know. I really would, I admire this person, I admire the, the whatever, the way he does this or she does that, and I want to be like that and help me to thank God that he has given them this gift, that's another way. Or I'm so jealous of this person, that's another way. You know the difference. Yes, ma'am. So uh, you said, and we have 
have to respect other, like if you, if someone is putting a boundary around them, you have to respect it. But on the other hand, uh, sometimes the, even the Bible tell us to try to go beyond it to help people. If you think that they're so depressed or they're putting shells around themselves just to separate themselves from others because they're depressed or they're bad, when should I stop? And when should I try not to like push it and go to help? Very you, good you my point. Yeah, I see your point. I think each one of these, my friends, each one of these five tips require a very important virtue that envelops them all. Wisdom. Wisdom. Um, I'll answer your question in a second. What do I mean by wisdom? Three things. What to say or what to do. How to say it and when to say it. That's it. So you have to be very wise and discerning. I want to help this person, but that will be at the expense of my boundaries. That will affect me when I'm called to help them. What should I do? Do you see the dilemma? Only you can answer that question. And the rule of thumb is, I protect my boundaries first before I help the other person. Because if I have no boundaries, you're not offering any help. You have to solidify your, like someone, in apologetics and apologetics conferences, someone says, um, when do I talk to non-believers about Jesus, about Christianity, the existence of God? I want to go and preach and so on and so forth. They say, no, don't. Don't do evangelism. Evangelize yourself first, and then talk to the atheist. If you're not grounded in your faith, and you have a conversation with an atheist, you're playing with fire. And I've seen it happen. So protect yourself, set your boundaries, become wholesome. Only then will you be able to help others. Do evangelism. Don't get me wrong. I want you to evangelize. But solidify, anchor yourself in the faith before you speak to someone about the faith. Yes, Annie. Uh, do you mind just giving us the titles of the remaining five tips? No. <laughs> Next year, but inshallah. Um, yes, I can give you the titles. I changed them quite a bit, so yeah, yeah. I'll give you the title later. Okay? One of, I'll give you one of them. Acquire a positive attitude or perspective on life. Okay? That was another five minute conversation. Okay, anybody, anyone else? Yes? Uh, yes, ma'am. Having a healthy heart, how do you find sufficient things right now? How do you find sufficient in Christ? <laughs> That's a, that should be the theme of next conference. <laughs> That's a good question. Excellent question. Abuna, do you mind if you chime in? I'll make it the title for the uh, next conference. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good way to dodge the question. Do you want to chime in on that? Because that's uh, the reason why. I'm because that's a, a very pastoral question that I would feel Yanni. Unequipped to answer that one at the start. Please, go ahead. You're how making me insist that you stop. <laughs> how do you find your sufficiency in Christ? It's a great question. I'd love to learn. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, I see Christianity as not uh, values and morals. Christianity is not values and morals. Other, other, other religions they have values and morals, and maybe they abide to those values and morals even more than us. Wouldn't you agree? I think that it is it the case. case. Uh, our uniqueness in terms of our reading. Thank you, Abuna. in the world you will have tribulation, but I have overcome the world. 
the sufficiency in Christ is if the person is relating to Christ, and this is, this is a lifelong journey. So it's not just a, a, a state, but it is a progression. It's something that we grow into the knowledge of Christ. And this is something that cannot be uh, taught, but it's something to be more experienced than just to talk about it. Excellent. Yes. Thank you, Abuna. And I would say, I agree with Lucia Abuna 100%. I love the last words you mentioned. It's, it's not something that I can um, read upon, but it's something I love. It's the question itself, because it has a key word, sufficiency. George, so you George. imply that you can fine, be man. sufficient with Just Christ, the and that is the objective, is that Christ will give you that which you need. The um, I think it was C.S. Lewis that said, aim for Christ or aim for heaven, you'll get earth thrown in. Aim for earth, you'll get neither. So aim for Christ, you'll get your sufficiency and everything else. I think also there's a verse in Matthew chapter 5 that says, seek first the kingdom of heaven and everything else. So have your, having your sufficiency in Christ will include everything else where you don't need anything else. But it's an excellent question, and thank you, Mr. Okay, okay, we have the um, time is up, and maybe one last question. Let's make it uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> How would I know my unique purpose of, of my life? Oh. Like, to know him? <laughs> <laughs> but, but everyone of us would like to know God. <laughs> Okay. Um, we have dual purposes. Okay, let me let me just make it very quick. We have an overarching purpose that every single Christian has, which is to know God and to make him known. Love God and make him known. That's an overarching purpose. We can achieve this overarching purpose through this unique purpose that was given to you based on the God-given gifts that are unique to only Mina. Now, you need to know what these gifts are. A lot of ways you can do that. And you need to ask God, God, you've given me these gifts. Can I help me give them back to you? Whether in engineering, in medicine, in business, in whatever that is, being a monk, being married, having three kids, all of whatever that is, you have these unique gifts, uh, use them for the glory of God. But as, uh, as long as we all have this overarching purpose, which is to know God, grow in His knowledge, grow in His love, and share God with others. Let me say in closing that, um, that I have now, we're done. So I have enjoyed uh, sincerely my time with you. It has been a blessing. I've made getting a lot of connections with many of you. I'd like to keep in touch with you. I will miss you. I've been and I spent uh, much time with you this over, over this weekend. Um, thank you for inviting me to come and take the blessings of your fellowship. I love the Edge Convention. I love I, I love Marette and Ask what is that? The, the way you got you got your natural masters of ceremonies, MCs, and thank you, Abuna, for inviting me and for Abuna David and for each one of you. Keep in your prayers and I hope to see you again. Thank you.